I'm Michael Wall. I'm Vice President of Science and Conservation here at the San Diego Natural History Museum. I'm also uh, your friendly neighborhood curator of entomology. And uh, want to introduce a few people who you're going to see their names listed in the chat. And those are um, Christy, uh, Christy, <laughs> Krista, <laughs> Brittany, <laughs> and Lauren. And so you'll see their names and then in parentheses, it'll say the Nat um, next to them and, and the, their preferred pronouns uh, after that. And so if you have any um, questions about Zoom or the event itself, um, you can use the reactions button to raise your hand or you can send them a chat via the chat. We'd like uh, you all to introduce yourselves as well. Uh, and so feel free to do that in the chat. If you're representing a school or an organization here today, please let us know that in the chat. Um, you can also add your organization's name and pronouns to your Zoom name like we have done. So why the state of biodiversity? Uh, because we think the state of biodiversity is important. Uh, the intrinsic value of biodiversity aside, there are undeniable benefits of biodiversity and healthy ecosystems to both human health and just general quality of life. So why the state of biodiversity? Because we think everyone should have the knowledge to be strong advocates for the natural world. Speaking of advocates for the natural world, as conservations, uh, conservationists and advocates for sustainable land stewardship, the San Diego Natural History Museum, um, sorry, the San Diego Natural History Museum recognizes and respects the indigenous peoples um, as traditional stewards of the land. And specifically, we wanna recognize the Kumeyaay people whose ancestral homelands the museum currently occupies. We extend our respect and gratitude to the indigenous people who have lived on and cared for this land since time immemorial. As the original caretakers and conservationists, uh, we honor their continued legacy of understanding, caretaking, and upholding the pillars of biodiversity. <laughs> no, Lauren, you're gonna have to give it back. <laughs> Sorry. So for the still, still experiencing some technical difficulties here, folks. Um, is someone else going to share a screen? Is that what's happening now? No. Boy, no. Are... Yeah, I, I think I just really screwed it up. So if you <laughs> want to re share, my apologies, everybody. My remote control <laughs> request did not work, but <laughs> let's see. But the good thing is I'm not any more a part of this later, so everything will run smooth. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Lauren, for trying. <laughs> it was a, a, val a valiant effort. Um, <laughs> so here we go. Uh, so the agenda for the day. Um, in just a moment, we're we're going to have our four panelists um, begin, and we've got an excellent lineup today. One that's very um very central to the mission of the museum and uh with each speaker they're going to be bringing a unique uh, perspective on transborder conservation when the presentations wrap up around 10 a.m we will take a quick bio break following that we'll have about 20 minutes for audience q a please pop your questions into the chat as they occur to you We'll ask as many as we can at the end of all the presentations. Um, and at 1030, um, we'll unmute and head out to breakout rooms for discussion. Uh, and even after the event ends, we'd love to keep the conversation going. So please join the event's LinkedIn group to chat with other participants. And we are putting a link to that group in the chat now. We are recording the presentation. Um, we'll post the recording on our YouTube channel in about two weeks, so you can revisit the talk at that time. Only the speakers will be recorded, so we encourage you to leave your camera on if you'd like to. Microphones, on the other hand, are off, uh, and we will turn them on for the networking portion of the event at the end. Before we get started, uh, if uh, we have some other upcoming events that we think will be of interest to you, uh, if you haven't yet, please be sure to register for the other State of Biodiversity um, series that are coming up. They're in the same, same bat channel, same bat time. 
um, for the next two weeks. And um, next week's panel discussion is on pandemic era science. If you're interested in the border ecosystem, which I suspect you are since you're joining us here today, um, then you don't want to miss our April 9th pop-up lunchtime talk, the state of biodiversity at the border. This is an invite-only Zoom event, um, and, and it, you'll learn how to participate in the 2021 uh, Border BioBlitz, a community science effort to record as many species as possible along the U.S.-Mexico border during the month of April. We're putting a link to that in the chat. The event is not advertised on our main website, so you're going to want to get that link out of the chat and click on it if you're interested in attending. And today's Spanish interpreter, Fernanda, uh, will do live interpretation of that event too. So um, it would be the opportunity to tune in in uh, two languages. A couple of notes about accessibility. Pandemic is given us uh, new, new ways to think about accessibility. And um, as you've probably already figured out, we do have live interpretation. Uh, um, Spanish interpretation is available. So, um, habla interpretación simultánea español, si quiere escuchar en español. Haga clic en el icono de globo en la parte inferior de la pantalla. Pan Always have trouble with this one. Pa pantalla. Uh, de Zoom. Y uh, muchas gracias por acompañarnos hoy. Um, subtitles are also available. So uh, if you'd like to uh, see subtitles, you can click on the closed caption button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and select show subtitle. Those are done automatically. So uh, they sometimes have funny things in them. Now for the main event. Um, we are going to go through our four speakers, uh, and our very uh, first speaker up to bat is Dr. Daniel Thornton. Daniel is an assistant professor in the School of Environment at Washington, Washington State University, where he directs the Mammal Spatial Ecology and Conservation Lab. His research focuses on understanding the impacts of climate and land use change on carnivores and other large mammals, as well as developing methods for monitoring species across large landscapes. He maintains a geographic focus on the Americas, and he's currently conducts field work in the Pacific Northwest and Mesoamerica, and has conducted regional spatial analyses to support conservation efforts in both North and South America. Dan, thanks for joining us today. We'll look forward to your talk. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank you to the museum for inviting me here today to talk about this really, really interesting topic. Um, and so, so for my talk, it's, I'm really going to focus on sort of a broad overview of the challenges and advantages to working across borders. Um, to conserve biodiversity. It won't be specific to the US-Mexico border, but I think a lot of what I'm going to talk about is relevant to that situation. So the first thing I want to say and emphasize is that um, transboundary conservation is, is really a timely issue in conservation biology. So there's been sort of a groundswell of academic attention to this topic. I just list here three publications from 2020 and 2021, in really prestigious international journals um, dealing with different aspects of the transboundary conservation issue. And there's been a whole bunch of research over the past three to five years that has, that has come out. In addition to the academic attention, there's also quite a bit of attention to transboundary issues from conservation NGOs and organizations that work on the ground. Here I just pull a few clips from, from recent newsroom websites of various groups showing that they're really focused on this issue as part of their platform for 21st century conservation. So why why this attention? You know, why are we wanting to think transboundary when we talk about conserving biodiversity? And of course, fundamentally, this is about the fact that nature doesn't recognize international boundaries, and therefore, probably our conservation strategies shouldn't either. If we just take species as, as an example, um, 
you know, many species have their ranges that cross more than one country. Um, as a matter of fact, about 60% of all mammals in North and South America uh, have a range that crosses at least one political border. Many cross four or five political borders. And you see some examples here on the left-hand side of um, some of these species with their transboundary ranges in South America, obviously crossing more than one country. And when we have a range of a species that crosses the border, oftentimes then we have populations that are very strongly linked across those international borders. So populations of a species might be linked through migratory movements that occurs for some species. They might be linked through just more general territorial dispersal movements. Um, as an example of this in the lower right hand corner here, you know, you see the movement pathways for some radio collared um, links that we collared in Washington, but you can see they immediately walked across the border into southern British Columbia and, and Canada. And so when we have populations that are linked across borders through these processes, we have to work transboundary to conserve them. That's all, all well and good, but I think it's worth asking the question, are there any sort of proven reasons why cooperating between countries might improve outcomes, might improve our ability to conserve biodiversity? And I just wanna highlight a few things here. Um, Several studies have shown that when we work cooperatively across borders, we're often better able to monitor and assess population status of species. So here, here's just an example from the critically endangered um, leopard subspecies, one of the most endangered cats in the world. Um, and it exists in this transboundary landscape between China and Russia that you see here on the left. And these researchers actually showed that by collaborating and combining data sets, in this case, camera tracking data from both countries, they were able to get a more accurate and precise understanding of the leopard population than if either country had worked by itself. And this type of thing has been shown for grizzly bears, wolves, gibbons. Uh, we've shown it for white peccaries in Central America, a whole bunch of species. And if we're better able to monitor species, we're gonna be better able to conserve them. Another thing I wanna emphasize is that oftentimes if we work transboundary, we can do more efficient and proactive conservation planning. And the example here that I think is really good to talk about is climate change. Um, we know that climate change is gonna reshuffle species. They're gonna to have to move to maintain areas of suitable climate. And oftentimes they're gonna to have to shift their range across a backdrop of political borders. And there was a really interesting study that was just done recently um, that tried to map this out globally. Um, and they wanted to identify hotspots where you're gonna have species shifting across political borders. And you see the results for mammals and birds here on the left. Obviously, lots of species are gonna be shifting across borders. I'll point out that the US-Mexico border is gonna be a hotspot of shifting ranges um, for mammals and to some extent for birds as well. And so if we have a species that has to move its climatic space from one country to another, obviously working transboundary is gonna be fundamentally important to conserving connectivity and protections for that species and the ultimate fate of that species under climate change. And then lastly, I wanna point out that we're often better able to design protected area networks if we work transboundary. And this is because protected areas tend to be clustered near borders. So we've shown in the Americas, for example, you have a greater amount of protected area near the border. And that protected area is often more connected because protected areas tend to be clustered around these border areas. So if our goal is to um, design connected large protected area networks, which it often is in conservation, then we need to think and work transboundary that happen. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the challenges to cooperating across borders in conservation, and, and there are many. Um, and it's one of the reasons why you know, transboundary conservation can be difficult. Um, one thing that we've looked at a little bit is that you know, oftentimes neighboring, neighboring countries will have very different um, priorities for protection of individual species. 
Um, so as an example, Canada lynx, again, this is a species I work with a lot up in Washington state. This is a species that's listed uh, under the Endangered Species Act. It's a threatened species in the contiguous 48. But right across the border in Canada, it's unprotected and harvested for fur. And so as you can imagine, those very different priorities are going to create some challenges when trying to work cooperatively in the conservation and management of this species. And in fact, we've shown that this is kind of a common occurrence for a variety of species across the US-Canada, US-Mexico borders, as well as throughout the Americas. Border security is another big issue that's obviously going to impact transboundary conservation, um, particularly border fences. These can be massive structures. You see here on the left, the picture of the India-Pakistan border that is visible from space. The US-Mexico border obviously is a massive, large structure. And numerous studies have shown how these structures can prevent species from moving across borders. They can disconnect populations. And they're going to just in general make cooperative management and conservation of species across borders more difficult. And then there are a raft of other socio-political complexities that are going to hinder conservation efforts. Um, you know, different countries, neighboring countries can have very different capacities and funding for conservation and management. They can have differences in land use or land tenure rights that can make designing kind of integrated conservation strategies quite difficult. There may just be a general lack of mechanism for or history of cooperation. There might be conflict between those countries that can hinder cooperation. There was an interesting study that was published where they actually tried to map out um, the feasibility of transboundary conservation, taking into account these social political complexities um, at a global scale. And they ranked borders from low to high in terms of feasibility based on governance and cooperation metrics. Um, and you can see, you know, first of all, North America ranks pretty highly in terms of feasibility and that's really encouraging, but many areas of the globe um, working cooperatively across borders is going to be quite difficult. So I want to finish with this slide and, and thinking about, you know, where we're going with 21st century transboundary conservation. You know, it seems to me that this is an example of what we call a, sort of a coupled human and natural system, where we've got a whole bunch of ecological processes and questions that we need to address in border regions, such as where, why, how species are linked across borders, how they might shift the ranges across borders. And then we have a whole series of socio-political questions regarding where can we cooperate? What mechanisms exist to encourage cooperation? Where are the best areas to, to cooperate along borders? And bringing those two together and answering those questions will be kind of where, where we'll find and develop successful transboundary conservation strategies. I think I'm out of time. Thank you very much uh, for listening. I'll leave you with um, some images of two cats showing off their, their canines from some camera trapping work that we've done in, in two transnational landscapes. Uh, a cougar from the binational glacier Waterton between the US and Canada, and a jaguar from the trinational Maya forest between Mexico, Belize, and Guatemala. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. That was uh, fantastic and a real sort of um, setting, setting, the, setting the table for uh, the, the conversations that are can, getting ready to come to us next. And um, I would encourage folks that if you have questions, you're welcome um, to go ahead and put those into the chat, but we'll, we, we won't be um, uh, doing uh, Q&A until the very um, after all the speakers have talked. So um, but if you put them into the chat, then we'll make sure to, to gobble those up so that uh, they are um, uh, top of mind when, when we get to that portion of the presentation. So thank you again, Dan. Next up, we have uh, Dr. Arturo Ramirez Valdez. Uh, he earned his PhD at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where he currently serves as a staff researcher working on questions related to marine conservation and resource management. After finishing his bachelor's of science in marine ecology and his um, master's of science in oceanography, Arturo uh, taught for four years at the University of Baja California in Ensenada, um, Mexico. 
He's earned a number of prestigious awards, including the UC Mexis Conacyt Doctoral Fellowship um, in 2014, the Pedro um, Mercado Sanchez Mexican Oceanography Award, and the Jose Alvarez del Villar National Award, both of those back in 2010 for his research on marine biogeographic regionalization along the Baja California Peninsula, which he will be talking to us about today. Arturo, thanks for being with us today. Look forward to your presentation. Thank you so much, Michael. Okay, all right, good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in, and thank you so much for the invitation to the San Diego Natural History Museum. I am thrilled to be here with all of you. It is my pleasure to present part of the research that I developed as part of my PhD dissertation, and the title is Marine Conservation Across Political Borders. But before we move forward to the marine system, let me show you what the scenario is in the terrestrial environment. Traditionally, we say that the species don't recognize political borders, but recent studies have shown this is no longer true in many cases. We have learned about compelling examples of how physical barriers in the political border have disrupted species connectivity, fragmented uh, habitat and ecosystems, the value of conservation investment and research efforts, and bypass environmental and economic laws. While this is very evident in the terrestrial environment, here is an example, a section of the border wall between the US-Mexico border. In the marine environment, there are no walls or fences. Most of the species distribution patterns respond to the currents and changes in temperature. If that is true, I wonder if we will be able to reveal differences related to marine biodiversity and conservation across the US-Mexico border. And we saw the political borders challenge our conservation and management efforts in the marine environment. It turns out this question has anything but a simple answer. So being a fish lover, I have learned which books and articles to consult when interested in learning about uh, a species distribution. Milton Love's book shown here has a very precise information about the distribution of fishes in this region. Interestingly though, the documented distribution of many fishes in this region and here in San Diego. Here is just a few examples. Our understanding of the species distribution tells us that there is no reason to expect a discontinuity in the distribution of marine species in the border region. This distribution pattern responds to abrupt changes in temperature and habitat. And the biographic provinces clearly draw these patterns. In this case, the marine region across the US-Mexico border is part of the San Diego province here in yellow, which goes from Point Conception all the way to Magdalena Bay, close to the tip of the Baja California Peninsula. And the region between Magdalena Bay and Punta Eugenia represents the biographic transition zone, where the species from the temperate and the tropical affinity converge. If this is the case, why does the political border, or San Diego more specifically, represent the distribution limit for many species? So I decided to address the, that question by recording all fish species present in the transition region and proving that these indeed represent the real biographic break. This question took me to Cedros Archipelago, located in the northern limit of the transition zone. This group of islands in the central region of Baja has been recognized for the remarkable biodiversity, but also for the very little attention of scientific research. So after our field surveys, literature review, and searches in scientific collections, we recorded a total of 269 fish species. This graph represents the latitudinal distribution range of all the species recorded in Cedros Archipelago. Each bar is the species geographic distribution. The bold line here is the, where the Cedros Archipelago is located. The red bars are those species with tropical affinity. The blue bars are those species with temperate affinity. And the black bars represent the, the widespread white species. Contrary to what the literature once implied, that is a distribution break in the US-Mexico border, here we documented that the Cedros Archipelago represents the transition between the temperate and the tropical realm. We recorded the 
range extension of 20 species. Some of them have not previously been recorded south of San Diego. The scarce transboundary research creates a false, a false illusion of the species distribution in this region. Now, on the understanding of a species distribution represents the baseline of every species management plan. If we miss incorporating a precise information of the distribution in our management strategies, our understanding of the population health may fail. Let me show you one example of this next. I will argue that there is no more conspicuous example of the difference in management across the US-Mexico border than the giant sea bass. Here is a picture of this charismatic and beautiful fish. The giant sea bass has been protected in California for more than 38 years, while in Mexico it is still an open fishery. Here I want to highlight the distribution of these species. The size of the dots represents how many times uh, Sorry, the, the blue dots represents actual record of these, of these species. And the size of the dot represents how many times this species has been recorded in that specific location. And as you can see, more than 70% of the distribution is south of the border. And keep that in mind for the rest of this story. So the Yayan sea bass is the largest coastal bony fish in this region. And as a top predator has an important role in the rocky reefs and kelp forests across the Californias. Its fishery was crucial in the development of the fishery of the recreational fishery in California until the population collapsed. Recreational activities associated with the giant sea bass, such as scuba diving and aquariums, represents a multi-million dollar industry in California. After the giant sea bass fishery collapsed in California, we have seen a growing concern about its population health. So much so that a simple search in Google will lead you to this information. The breeding population of the giant sea bass is believed to be only about 500 individuals. If this information is real, this could be one of the most threatened marine fish species worldwide. But how we got to this point? Well, two pieces of information are key to explain this. First, the International Union for conservation of nature, added the giant sea bass to the red list as a critical endangered species due to the population being considered severely fragmented, leading to a continuing decline of mature individuals. But they recognize no data whatsoever from Mexican populations. The second piece of information is this paper published by Chabot and collaborators in 2015, where they reported an effective population size fewer than 500 individuals, which only includes sexually mature females, something's been less than 10% of the total population. Let me bring back the distribution map of this species. Now in the right panel is the scientific research we have about this species measured in peer reviewed papers by location. Here, the size of the dot represents the number of papers with data on that specific location. This shows a clear asymmetry in the scientific research focused on this species. And so I began to wonder if this discrepancy in research effort could have an effect on our scientific perception of the population size of the giant sea bass. With that in mind, together with a group of talented job researchers, from the US and Mexico, and guided from advisors from both sides of the border, I started Proyecto Mero Gigante, which is a program aimed to fill the gaps in the knowledge of this species in Mexico. This is the fishery data that shape what is currently known about the giant sea bass population health. Fishery catches in tons from 1913 to 2016. Here, the trend in navy blue is the U.S. fleet fishery catches in U.S. waters. And sky blue also catches from the U.S. fleet, but in Mexican waters and landed in California. So the collapse of the fishery in California was in 1932. And since then, the Jan Sivas fishery was supported by catches coming from Mexico. After 50 years of catches below 10 tons, a fishery bass was imposed in the US. And the mark on around 1970s, 
is what had been taken as the collapse of the giant Sivas population. But contrary to what one might think, the decrease in the US fishery catch in Mexico into the 1970s was most likely a consequence of the binational treaty of fishery management signed in 1968, which limited the catch of commercial important species, not do the, do the, the decrease in the resource availability. Now, here is the historical reconstruction of the giant sea bass fishery, including now the fishery catches from the US and Mexico. And I would like to highlight that the, this reconstruction was only made possible thanks to this binational collaboration. In blue, again, is the US fleet fishery catch, and in green, the Mexican fleet catch. The historical fishery catches from the Mexican fleet changed completely the current narrative of what we know about the giant sea bass. Fishery catches from the Mexican fleet have averaged 50 tons per year over the last 60 years. And to the surprise, surprise of many, we did not find evidence of the collapse of the giant sea bass population south of the border. Here are some reasons to support the idea that the giant sea bass represent a single population in the entire distribution. Genetic connect connectivity across the US-Mexico border and spawning aggregations reported in the US and in Mexico. So if we add up all the fishery catches from both countries, what we see is that although a clear decrease in the fishery catch over the past 20 years, it is likely that the giant sea bass population never dropped to the numbers previously reported. So the good news is that the giant sea bass may not be a critical endangered species anymore, but of course there is still much work to do to improve the management of this iconic fish. Now here is a story in one graph. In blue is the US and in green, Mexico. I found a strong asymmetry in the scientific research more peer review papers from the US, more economic investment in research and conservation north of the border, fishery production is higher in the Mexican side, the same for the economy associated with the fishery. However, the economy associated with ecotourism is quite higher in US. And the conservation effort is all in blue, which represents the 38 years of the fishery closure. We will not expect to see symmetric management of marine resources across the US-Mexico border. However, this is a clear example of the challenges we face when there is not cooperation in research and management of a fishery resource. So my final remarks are significant differences in a study effort may bias our understanding of species distribution and population health. Asymmetry in the management of marine resources across the US-Mexico border can undermine conservation efforts. Lack of collaboration to understand our natural world across political borders can have a profound influence of the perception of species distribution, population health, and the economies associated with them. And for all of this, the cooperation is needed. Thank you so much for your attention. That was fantastic, uh, Arturo. Thanks. Thank you so much. It's uh, the I always find th this sort of work fascinating, where the, um, the where like the 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 cause for something that we think is um, you know inherent to the natural world is has is because of these sort of so socio biases type things, and um, I've never. Never would have thought it until you laid it out in such a beautiful way. So thank you um, for, for taking the time to talk to us. And again, we'll, we'll have questions um, for you after the rest of the folks have um, given their presentations. So thank you again. And we'll be hearing more from Arturo um, uh, at the end when we do our panel discussion. We are now going uh, to move on to Louise Mistal. She is executive director of the Sky Island Alliance, where she has worked for the past 14 years. She was previously um, principal investigator on a project to collaboratively, collaboratively develop a climate smart landscape conservation design for the Sky Island region, focused on streams, springs, and grasslands. 
She uh, holds a BA in ecology and evolutionary biology, a BS in microbiology, and an MS in geographic information systems, all from the University of Arizona. For her master's work, uh, she mapped binational conservation priorities for wildlife corridor and habitat protection in the Sky Island region. And she's committed to crafting creative solutions for pressing conservation concerns and building collaboration amongst uh, diverse partners. So thank you for being with us today, Luis. Looking forward to your presentation. Great, thanks so much. And I assume you can go ahead and see my screen there. Great. Uh, thanks very much for having me. What an honor to be part of this um, panel talking about the Sky Island region. Um, so we'll take a little detour that direction. Um, I'm coming to you today from uh, Tucson, Arizona, which is the traditional lands of the Tona Odom and Pascoyaki people. And all of the work that we do at Sky Island Alliance is on indigenous lands. So I do want to acknowledge that this morning. Uh, I'm going to take you on a little tour of the Sky Islands to introduce you if you're not yet familiar to them um, and look at some of our wonderful biological diversity here and then talk about a, a large landscape planning effort I've been part of um, to think about adapting to a changing climate and how we do that across international boundaries. So Sky Island Alliance works to protect and restore the diversity of life and lands in the Sky Island region of the US and Mexico, which is primarily in Arizona and Sonora, Southern Arizona, and Northern Sonora. And we do this work by connecting people to place. So people like you who may or may not live here um, and the residents here in the region, we really want, um, like uh, Michael said at the beginning, strong advocates for our natural world here. Um, we also work to conserve wildlife and the space they need to roam, uh, protect water sources, and bring them back to flowing health where they need restoration support. And then what I'm going to focus on today, uh, building the science and the large landscape collaboration needed to protect this really special place. Oops. Um, so what are Sky Islands, if you're not familiar, they are forested, uh, isolated mountains that rise up out of desert and grassland seas, as we like to say. Um, at, in Tucson, in the desert floor, in the Sonoran Desert, we're at about 2,000 feet elevation, and our tallest Sky Island gets up to 10,000 feet elevation. There's 55 of these Sky Islands, give or take, there's some different science around this, but um, in uh, Arizona and Sonora, and you can kind of see them outlined here. And um, this is really a connected ecoregion, which is, is something uh, Daniel and Arturo were both talking about. You can see the US-Mexico border running right through the heart of the Sky Island region, which is a major uh, conservation uh, challenge for us, as we've been hearing this morning. Um, and now with border wall construction, it's gotten quite a bit more difficult, but um, this is really an amazing place in the world where we've got these different biotic influences coming together, the Sonoran and Chihuahuan deserts, the Rocky Mountain and Sierra Madre, um, so really high biological diversity. And land management is a patchwork here, um, which is on top of the um, international boundary issue, so a mix of federal land, state land, private land, Ejido land in Mexico. Um, so real complex um, conservation picture and which necessitates what we've been talking about here, working across jurisdictions and political boundaries um, to do conservation work. And then there's also a lot of complexity with topographic diversity. And you can really see in this map, these green islands popping out of the desert sea. So this issue of isolated mountains um, adds to the complexity. Oops. Uh, so the amazing biological diversity, I have a little bit of eye candy for you. Um, roughly half the types of birds in North America live here. We've got 14 species of hummingbirds, which are some of my favorite. I think 28 species of bat, um, 120 different um, amphibians and reptiles, more than 4,000 plant species. And our fuzzy charismatic mammal friends, we've got 114 mammal species. And the ocelot, 
jaguar and coati that you see here are species that are at the northern end of their range in the Sky Island region. We're really happy to have them. And as was mentioned before, as we think about climate change, you know, these species and others that may not yet be residents here um, are important conservation targets uh, as we think about animals needing to move around to respond to a changing climate. So uh, just um, thinking about transboundary conservation, we got to love on the jaguars a little bit. They're such a beautiful, amazing species. They're really a perfect example for uh, transboundary conservation, like we've been talking about, the need for that cross-boundary work. Jaguars have uh, were extirpated in Arizona, so they were killed off um, earlier in the 20th century, and they have been coming back, which is a wonderful conservation success story. We've had six different individual jaguars photographed in Arizona in the last uh, years or so. And so they're making a recovery here as an endangered species in the US where there's a lot of wonderful protected open space for them to um, find habitat and what they need. And their core breeding population is in uh, Northern Sonora in the map down there near the Northern Jaguar Reserve and Sipa. So uh, going to continue to recover in the US, we really need to put these pathways in this space across the US border um, to ensure that they continue to come back. And then uh, thinking about overlaid on all of this are climate change and other large scale threats. And, and this was covered, I think, a little bit for sure with, with Daniel, but um, you know, climate change, shifts in water availability, big changes in wildfires, um, develop, human development, all these are occurring at a much larger extent than that of any individual management area. And so we need to address these conservation issues at a large landscape. Uh, scale, if and which requires transcending uh, jurisdictions and individual management areas. And it really requires uh, what's been spoken about a lot, this coordinated planning and action at a scale that's relevant to ecology and to conservation of these species. And so uh, one project that I've been involved in with this transboundary conservation work is with the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Um, you may have heard of, of these landscape conservation cooperatives. Um, this was an initiative started by the Department of Interior to respond to climate change at a large landscape scale. Uh, this particular cooperative was led by the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Together, managers, stakeholders, keys, all uh, to work toward sustaining resilient landscapes capable of responding to climate change and these large scale environmental challenges. Uh, and the key piece of this work was really incorporating climate change considerations and adaptation strategies into existing natural resource management. And you can see on the in the map on the right, it's a really huge sprawling geography that the Desert and Landscape Conservation Cooperative was focused on. And so we uh, led a, a smaller planning effort within that geography uh, for the transboundary Madrean watersheds, which pretty much wholly overlap the um, Sky Island region, plus a little more. And um, the focus here was really on um, looking at this region to think about how we protect integrity of ecological systems, uh, and thinking a lot about structural and functional connectivity for the landscape, for the movement of, of genes or the movement of individuals like jaguars. Um, so how do we keep this place, how do we keep biodiversity thriving here even as climate and, and landscape changes occur? And um, the approach was to uh, assess ecosystem condition and trends using a portfolio of spatial indicators and um, develop, importantly, develop some scenarios of future landscape condition that included climate projections, and then look at where there's important biological cores and then these corridors that connect them and get to this climate adaptation piece. So the climate smart conservation design is kind of a lot of things in one, it's a funky cocktail. It's a lot of different things in one big glass here, um, thinking about stressors and pressures on the landscape, 
Um, the shared vision and goal piece was really important. I'll talk a little more about that. Bringing in existing data, these indicators of ecosystem condition. And then really importantly, we wanted to make this very relevant immediately to management. And so management questions really guided our work. So we, um, our first step was really de developing a shared vision and goals. Uh, and this I think is really a big vital piece of transboundary conservation is getting on that same page uh, with the different stakeholders about where you have shared interest and, sh and common ground to do this kind of uh, conservation work. And so we held workshops in U the US and Mexico with dozens of different um, agencies and organizations participating to talk about where we're gonna work together to mitigate vulnerability. So where are uh, the, the greatest threats across the landscape and the greatest opportunities? And then how can we um, effectively implement adaptation strategies? And so the goals that emerged for the transboundary Madrean watersheds really focused on biodiversity, um, this unique uh, special place with native and endemic species. The connectivity was, was really important, thinking about these isolated sky islands and keeping wildlife connected and ecosystems connected. And then of course, our quality of life as humans depends on the health of our natural world. So thinking about ecosystem services. And what we did in this work was um, select a portfolio of spatial indicators, um, ecologically and socially relevant, useful that are useful to inform management and conservation goals and ultimately can guide placement of conservation and uh, restoration and climate adaptation activities on the ground. And we um, utilize the management questions and concerns to um, combine indicators to provide insight into specific management concerns. And we looked at um, these transboundary watersheds uh, that we were able to get sufficient data for across the US-Mexico border and watersheds in the US, and then focused in on, on Huck 8 watersheds in a lot of cases, uh, smaller watersheds that are, um, that are relevant for thinking about implementation on the ground. And this is just an example of the Madrean evergreen woodland um, ecosystem, looking at some indicators and the combination of indicators. So wildfire frequency, extent, and severity was of, of great interest to managers. And folks are really thinking about, are we in danger of losing some of these forests permanently due to large fires? So here's an example, spatial products, um, where we're looking at areas of these forested cores and the level of risk for uh, damage or loss due to high uh, burn risk. So trying to get an idea where to focus efforts across the landscape for restoration and, that, and on the ground adaptation work. Um, so we had a number of products coming out of this around water, uh, grasslands, for our forests, Sonoran de desert scrub and connectivity. Um, and you can see more information at the link that Emma shared in the chat. Um, oops. Oh. And then um, uh, that was just a taste of the products. There's a lot more in an interactive map viewer. And then I just wanted to share some thoughts on challenges and successes. So, you know, this big international landscape, we've heard a lot about some of the challenges working there. Um, but one of, the, one of the advantages of focusing on this ecoregion eco versus a particular management unit or just stopping looking at things on the other side of the border is uh, under getting an understanding of for individual managers of their, their resources contribution to the regional picture. So gaining a sense of how activities might affect neighboring resources and really importantly, building the coordination across jurisdictions and borders, which lays the groundwork for successful conservation activity. And then um, engaging partners through workshops was really vital. It's, be interesting to see how we do that going forward with COVID, but um, you know, keep getting people in the same room and working to, to identify those shared goals is so vital. And then um, with that sort of asking questions of the users and users of the information all along, we were able to produce relevant outcomes and integrate with other planning processes. 
And so I'll just close by going back to our Jaguar friend and saying that, um, you know, if we protect this connected open space, they, they will recover. They're showing us that. Um, we've got a, a big, yes, I see some border wall questions in the chat. We've got a big challenge with border wall construction right now. Fortunately, we've got um, some corridors that are still open across the US-Mexico border. And I didn't get a chance to talk about this today, but um, we're, we have a border wildlife study program that is uh, using the TEAMS protocol in um, one of those corridors that is still open to raise awareness about protecting that in really important corridor. And of course, we'll be working from our side to take down wall sections if we can get that done in really these really important corridors. So um, I think I'll stop it there. Thank you very much. Thanks, Louise. Fantastic. Uh, great to hear about the work that you all are doing. Um, the We're going to continue because we are uh, a little, little behind on time, but I do see there's an active chat going on. Um, I saw that Arturo has responded to some questions in the chat um, and, and we are grabbing those questions that, and we'll come back and visit them um, after uh, all the speakers have had a chance to talk. And also want to remind everyone that we are gonna have breakout um, rooms at the end of this and each of the speakers will be in a separate breakout room. So there'll be an opportunity to follow up uh, with folks um, directly at, at the end of the event. So keep that in mind. With that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Having fallen in love with uh, the Baja California uh, Peninsula, Dr. Lorena Villanueva Almanza did her research on desert oases for her PhD at UC Riverside. In school, she also participated in science outreach events, wrote for the California Botanical Society's newsletter, and started a science communication group at UCR. After she finished her PhD, she became outreach coordinator of the California Botanical Society, and recently she was appointed edit editor of Botany One, a weblog uh, produced by the Annals of Botany Company. She works to make science accessible to the Hispanic community in the US and in Mexico and is interested in serving underrepresented groups in STEM. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Lorena. Thank you for joining us and I look forward to your talk. Thank you, Michael, and thank you all for being here. Um, it's great to have simultaneous translation, a dream for me, especially because I'm so interested in science communication and making science accessible to a wider audience. So today, what I'm going to talk to you about is um, about my PhD project, which I did at the University of California, Riverside. And, and it's a tale basically about two palms that I'm, I'm pretty sure you're very familiar with. Um, it's the genus Washingtonia that is distributed in Alta and Baja California. Um, so one thing that caught my attention about these palms, especially um, Washingtonia robusta that's native to Mexico is that we see them all the time in Southern California. So much so that even at the end of the 19th century, the LA Times already knew that they would give a tropical appearance to Southern California um, because they had been so heavily planted um, by the end of the century. This is a very quick example of one of those cases. This is Magnolia Avenue, which is considered a historical street in Riverside. And you can see Washingtonia uh, filifera being planted around 1870. And then a series of photographs just showing the development of those palms and really making it a really beautiful image in, in Riverside. But what I'm, I was really intrigued about was the other species of Washingtonia, which is Washingtonia robusta. Washingtonia robusta, although it's native to Mexico, it has been heavily planted in Southern California. It has even been considered an invasive species. And it's ironic because it's the icon of places like LA and at the same time it inhabits uh, places that are threatened because of water extraction and because of the development of uh, hotels. But it all started out with with this illustration. Um, it's the type of Washingtonia robusta. And for the taxonomists out there, you 
probably imagine, well, this doesn't serve any purpose in identifying or distinguishing it from Washingtonia proliferae, and you would be absolutely correct. This is a young specimen, and apparently the person that first described Washingtonia robusta, which was Herman Wenland, said that the type locality or the original place where Washingtonia robusta had been collected was the Sacramento River in Northern California. And of course, we know that this is not the native distribution and there was probably a naturalized population or an introduced palm. This illustration was later used as a lectotype and we know that it was from a cultivated specimen in the south of France. And because it was just such an important plant for horticulturalists at the time, Herman Wenland was pressed to reveal the source from where he had gotten the seeds of this species that he described. And he admitted in 1888 that he didn't know where um, Washington Robusta actually was, was growing. So it became a mystery and for me it became an obsession during my PhD. Now you see these two species growing side by side in Riverside. This is University Avenue. On the left hand of your screen, you will see Washingtonia filifera or the native California fan palm. Um, and then right across from it, a line of very tall and skinny Washingtonia robustas. You will see the natural distribution on the map to the right. So in green, Washingtonia robusta extending north to the border between the states of Baja California Sur and Baja California and Washingtonia filifera um, living at the U.S.-Mexico border in Southern California and the Northern Canyons of Baja California. But what catches your attention or what caught my attention initially was that area um, between those dashed lines in which we didn't know what was happening. Some researchers would say that Robusta would extend as far north as the dash line A, and some others would say that it would go to the border between both Mexican states. So that was my question. What is happening in between in the field that we're not seeing in the streets of Riverside? One other thing that was interesting to me was that when the genus was first described, none of the species had dimensions for their diameter, which is one of the most usually traits to distinguish between both species. It was not until um, 1999 that finally Richard Felger and Elaine Dreal gave measurements. But you can still see that there's a very fuzzy line on what can be considered Washingtonia filifera and Washingtonia robusta. And so we addressed this question using morphological traits. We wanted to know how, do, how does vegetative morphology vary in natural populations along its entire distribution range? So for that, it became a project working both in Mexico and the US sampling a 1300 kilometer latitudinal transect in all of the oases that I'm showing you here. Um, this was a dream for me come true, absolutely. It was wonderful. And from each of these oases, we took measurements of 20 palms, um, 10 that were the tallest individuals. And then we also collected leaves of those individuals that had a height between five and seven meters. And that's just because it's the height that we could reach with our pole. Um, we took the same measurements that had been used in the taxonomic literature to describe these two species. And then from those that we could reach, and you can see that these palms can get really massive in their natural habitat. This is Verrendo Canyon in Baja California. And that's my friend, Eric Focht, who is almost two meters in height. And you can see that he's just tiny compared to that massive palm. Um, we took measurements, of course, of leaf width and leaf um, length, also the petiole, the hastula, and other new traits that had not been recorded before, such as leaf color and specifically feria, stomatal density, and delta carbon-13, just to be aware of the differences of the sites in which they were growing in terms of their ecological conditions. And then we wanted to know how closely associated these traits were with latitude. So how much they were changing as we moved um, along this climb or this latitudinal transit. And what we found was something that was not very surprising. 
um, diameter at breast height and diameter at the base were changing very strongly with this latitudinal climb, but also uh, other traits like leaf green. So all the traits that you see highlighted in green are those that are changing more strongly with latitude. However, you will also note that the site does have a very strong influence on the appearance of these poems. And that is because, of course, each of the oases has very particular environmental conditions that are determining how these poems look. Um, we then ran other series of analyses and what we found was unsurprisingly that the morphological traits were basically telling us the same story. Um, Palms in the northern sites would have thicker and bluer leaves with thick stems and the populations in the south that you can see in green were having thinner and um, more green leaves, but also slender stems. What was still a question at this point was what is happening with the populations in the middle of the peninsula. So that transition area, which Arturo was referring to, but in this case, it was the terrestrial ecosystems that we were looking at. And what we did then was to try to solve this mystery, this time using more molecular markers. So single nucleotide polymorphisms. And we were wondering, would they reveal the same pattern? Would we be able to tell if those points in the middle of the peninsula were something different? And what would be the phylogenetic relationships in the population structure of Washingtonia? And very surprisingly, what we found was evidence that there indeed is a distinct genetic region in the middle of the peninsula, which is highlighted in blue on your screen. That's a mid-peninsula region um, that is very different from the southern clade marked in green again and from the northern clade that is marked in pink. And because this was so surprising, we also wanted to gather as much evidence as possible um, to be able to say, well, this is actually what is happening. And what we did is another um, analysis. Something that surprised us though, is a, that the genetic markers from the Sonoran population were quite unique. So despite them being um, morphologically similar to the Southern clade, the Sonoran population is something quite different. So that brings to me a question mark of, what are we going to do about this particular population in terms of conservation? Um, so did we find any evidence for a hybrid zone? Well, we did not. And you can see that with the colors that I'm showing you here, the mid-peninsula range is marked in blue and the northern is in pink. And then finally, the green one is the Baja California Sur um, populations. However, the only population does, that does show some sign of hybridization is in San Ignacio, that is in the middle of your screen. It's a population marked in pink. And that is not surprising because as I mentioned at the start of this talk, these palms have been moved around for cultivation purposes. So we did another analysis in which we found evidence of germplasm of seeds probably that were moved from the south of the peninsula into San Ignacio, which is at the border of Baja California, Sur and Baja California, that showed us evidence that these palms were indeed introduced there. Um, so going back to the map and finally solving that question, how does that map look right now? Well, again, the northern part didn't show um, any big surprises. There's that big clade of Washington with Lifra. In the south, again, Washington and Robusta, Nacapule in Sonora is still something quite interesting to me, as I said, because of that unique genetic diversity that's found in the populations of that canyon. And the really big surprise is just finding that um, region in the middle of the peninsula that's quite distinct from everything else. And that, of course, we're thinking about naming it under a different name. Um, so just basically solving that mystery that had been haunting botanists for a very long time. Basically, genotypic regions along Washingtonia's latitudinal climb, there was no hybrid zone except for San Ignacio. The regions pretty much coincide with phylogeographic breaks that are, have been proposed for the peninsula, and you can read more about that in our latest publication. 
And something that I really enjoyed about this project was that genetic data did confirm our morphological results initially. So that power of having morphological and genetic traits to solve a very old mystery was just fascinating to me. Um, because we're at a binational symposium, of course, I'd like to acknowledge my funding sources that both come from um, north and south of the border. Of course, UC Riverside that I miss so much, my co-authors, everybody that helped me in the field, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Lorena, fantastic stuff. Um, it's uh, that these sorts of uh, understanding the uh, patterns of diversity that span the entire peninsula is um, uh, completely our, our bread and butter at the museum. And so you were really sp speaking to my heart at least. <laughs> um, so thank you for the presentation. And we will uh, um, take some questions in just a few minutes. Uh, first up, what we are going to do is uh, just take a real quick five minute bio break um, for folks. We want to give our speakers a chance to maybe refill their coffee cups and, um, and encourage you all to do the same. According to my clock, we are at 10.09. So, oh, it just switched to 10.10. So uh, let's meet back here at 10.15 and uh, we'll go into Q&A with the entire panel at that time. And so we'll see you in five. Thanks, gang. All right, gang, we are slowly coming back online here for some Q&A. Should we get the entire panel spotlighted here? Okay. Well, Lorena, I think we'll uh, join us here in a second. I uh, want to thank you all again for uh, presentations inspired a lot of conversation in the chat um, and we'll dive into some of those some of those questions and I know you guys have uh, um, dove in and um, and uh, and answered some of those along the way and I'm going to start off with uh, a question actually for Arturo that didn't come from the chat but um, is is I think it, it, it embodies a, a lot of the things that actually did come up in the chat, and that's that what specific actions could be taken to promote a transboundary perspective on research and marine resource management? Great. Thank you for your for the question, Michael. Can I share my my presentation again? Sure. because I want to use this to answer that question. Ah, so, <laughs> locked and loaded. <laughs> I wasn't prepared, but... <laughs> so, of course, there are tons uh, of strategies that we can, that we can use, so, uh, and actually that folks are trying right now. Some things that I, I kind of uh, see as a very key, uh, actions are build capacity across the border, develop programs that provide training, field experience, and laboratory experience to graduate students and scholars from both sides of the border, of course. Establish a transboundary observatory system that improves marine, uh, marine, marine monitoring efforts. Uh, found coordinated marine research that address challenges from transboundary perspective and open communication, communication channels to address issues of national interest. So one of the things is actually Daniel, Dan mentioned this and, and Luis also mentioned this. Sometimes uh, intends to be able to do some uh, transboundary research, permits and all kind of government uh, paperwork is required. And sometimes even this is, 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 an, is an issue. 
So for instance, in Mexico, there is not a NOAA agency like the National Administration of Ocean Oceanographic Issues. Um, there is always kind of a dark side or like the dark place, like what exactly agency you need to go and uh -huh. request the permits. So right. this is one of the... Yeah, awesome. Thanks for that. Um, this is uh, a question from the, that came very early on in the chat. Um, and I'm going to um, uh, start with uh, Louise on this, but Daniel, I think you'll have um, some perspectives as well. But, you know, there's been lots of lots of conversations about the border wall um, and and uh, in the, the question is, if the U.S.-Mexico border wall is contiguous, which I think is questionable, um, what can be done to help species that, that don't fly, you know, um, tra trans, you know, get, a, get across the border? Are there some, like, solutions uh, to that tough nut to crack? Yeah, so I'm going to play the, the game answering questions to journalists and answer the question I want to answer. And say, <laughs> I love it. I'm going to say, it is definitely nowhere near being contiguous across the border. There are vital corridors that are still open and there are places that are in incredibly rugged and just going to be nearly impossible to build a wall through. So we have all of that going for us. Um, so I think the work we need to focus on is, is keeping those places that are still open, open, and then starting to restore areas uh, where we know there are really important cross-border wildlife corridors, places like the San Pedro River in Arizona that now has wall across it. I mean, there's some really important um, movement hotspots where we can reduce wall infrastructure and, and do a lot to help wildlife out. And then I'll just get on my soapbox for one minute and say, you know, a wall is, is a very medieval <laughs> response to, the, to very complex and nuanced issues around immigration. And it's, it's, it's not really a policy solution. So, you know, we have a lot of work in front of us to figure out how we address these immigration issues as a country without destroying all of our wonderful natural special places along the US-Mexico border and really harming indigenous communities there as well. Great. Dan, do you have anything to add on that? No, I think, you know, I, I agree with everything that Louise said that, you know, maintaining connected areas free of the border is going to be kind of fundamental to permitting connectivity. Uh, and I will say, it's, you know, it's not just necessarily non-flying species that are going to be impacted by border structures. You know, some birds fly quite close to the ground. You know, I think there was a U.S.-Mexico study that looked at pygmy owls flying about a meter off the ground, you know, so, and it's not necessarily just the border fence itself, but it's everything that goes with it. All the, the habitat loss, the construction, the greater human presence, that's going to impact not just non-flying species. So it, 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 it can have some pretty dramatic effects. Um, but yeah, I think obviously restoring those connections or, or maintaining some wall-free wall areas is going to be the, the best solution there in terms of permitting movement. Great, thank you guys. And, and I'll put a plug in um, again for this um, this brown bag seminar that we're having on um, our lunchtime seminar that we're having on uh, Friday because some of the people who are involved in that um, pro project are, um, are have done a lot of work on exactly what um, Daniel's talking about in terms of the destruction specifically associated with the construction of the wall and how it impacts there's a lot of there 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 are plant species that are you know only found right along the border and so um the destruction can have can have um uh big impacts on individual species that as as daniel pointed out it's not just the things that can't fly um uh and, and this actually is a good segue to to uh next question this is from um daniela zarate who always um puts the best questions in. Um, and it's a question for all the panelists. And she says, it's um, 
hard for me to separate conservation issues and the humanitarian crisis that occurs at the border, especially the Mexican-U.S. border. Ideally, for uh, environmental sake, there would be no borders. Um, but uh, do you use your work to campaign for demilitarization or reduction of the border? And are you vocal in the more um, human concerns of the border? And so um, I will start off with any of you all on that one. Anyone who wants to bite first? <laughs> Louise, I know you've got something to say. Yeah, I don't want to take up too much airspace, but um, <laughs> yes. So um, there's a number of things here that um, this question makes me think about. One is that a lot of places, at least in Arizona where I'm working, a lot of places that um, wall is currently getting built are not places where there's any kind of emergency um, or security issue. Um, I know that's what's being told to the public, but you know what's happening on the ground is different. Our ports of entry are really important places to focus security um, efforts. And yes, we absolutely um, work at, in partnership with organizations, a broad coalition of organizations who are working to demilitarize the border and reduce infrastructure at the border. Um, like I said before, that, that solution in most places is not it's not a policy solution. It's not, it's just not the right tool for real issues that are happening. Um, and I think, you know, it's really uh, the, oh, the other thing I wanted to say was, you know, the, these walls are being constructed in these places and in Arizona, primarily on public lands. So these are lands like national wildlife refuges and national park land that have been set aside to protect natural resources. And they are being constructed by waiving dozens and dozens of laws. And I feel like um, it's vital that we reinstate the rule of, of law in this country around protecting those places and indigenous communities there. Um, and, and the humanitarian issue is, is very real as well. And that's a, gonna take some nuanced policy response. And, um, and you know, this work is, is really affecting um, communities like the Tana Odom Nation who's had burial sites blown up to build the wall and that kind of thing because laws that protect those places have been waived. So it's just a really heinous <laughs> situation yeah. that yeah. Um, is in all intertwined with humanitarian issues for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Lorena, I have uh, two questions that sort of blend together uh, specifically for you. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll I'll just give you both of them. Uh, actually, sort of three questions. But um, would you are you planning on, or would you designate this um, differentiated palm, the the middle, the mid peninsular palm, I guess we could call it, um, as a species or a subspecies? Um, uh, and what's the level of genetic differentiation, I guess, on on that side of things? But then also, um, uh, blah blah blah. Um, the, there's a question from um, Donna where she asks, "What's um, is there a difference between the Washingtonian palm or Washingtonia palms, um, and what is commonly called in the San Diego, San Diego air, area the Mexican palm, which I, I would imagine is Brahea, is what she's referring to? But um, maybe if you could try to um, answer the subspecies species question then." I hadn't thought about Braia, um, but yes, just so that people know, we use Braia as an outgroup um, for our phylogenetic trees. Um, I'm gonna go back to the first two questions yep. of uh, Daniela. That question about whether these two or three should be considered species or subspecies is something that I have pondered in my sleep. <laughs> because I am planning on doing the taxonomic treatment for Washingtonia. The last one was done in 1936 and it's in need of a critical revision. Um, and although these decisions, of course, they bug me because they're very subjective, I've decided to call them um, different subspecies, even when it's incipient speciation. And that's because they are still able to hybridize, at least from the cultivated specimens that we see in the streets. So actually the hybrid has been scientifically described. It's called Washingtonia polygusta. Um, 
it has a type material, it's growing in Southern California. So I would imagine, um, even though I didn't sample that hybrids are all throughout Southern California and even beyond. Um, those are really hard to tell apart morphologically. So when people have told me to identify palms in the streets of Southern California, I'll go with a safe bet of stem diameter and those that have stem diameter that looks to me somewhat in between, I would say CF uh, Washingtonia filibusta, but I would say that that could only be answered using genetic markers at this point. So uh, answering the question of Donna of how can we differentiate these two, I'll just stick to the stem. Uh, stem is still a useful taxonomic trait and the color of the leaves. And um, one thing that I'm, I, I would be interested in knowing from the natural populations is the phenology of these populations. How, how able are they to, to have genetic, uh, uh, yeah, inter, to be genetically, to be in exchanging genetic information? Uh, we don't know this because they have been very poorly studied in their natural habitat and there's very few herbarium specimens. The herbarium specimens do not necessarily have information about flowering times or fruiting times. And that's because they are growing in very remote and inaccessible places that's really hard to get to. I've only made a trip to each of these oases. So this is a less than ideal from a scientific perspective. It's more than anyone could ask for. Um, so yeah, it's, there's still a lot to learn about them, especially from the natural habitat, which is very ironic. And I'll stop there. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And I, and I bet there's probably um, a, a whole cacophony of people who are in the chat who are willing to um, travel with you to revisit some of these uh, oases if you, if you need any need any help in the field <laughs> so <laughs> um so we we're we're going to go to our breakout rooms in just a second but you know our keynote speaker last week was um nancy knowlton and she talked about this idea of earth optimism and and her keynote really focused on uh the resiliency of the natural world and and um success stories of conservation efforts and i would like just really briefly, like as, as tightly as you can do it, like to hear from all the speakers about like what what are some of your reasons to feel optimistic um, about the about the work that you're doing and the and the um, and the the research and conservation efforts that are at hand. And we'll start with you, Dan. Yeah, great. So <laughs> that's a tough question. <laughs> I, I guess how I, I would answer it and sort of what gives me optimism just in general in, in my work is, you know, one of the great things about being a professor is I get to work with a whole bunch of different people. So I get to work with graduate students, I get to work with undergrads, I get to work with people, biologists from NGOs and government agencies. And, and I would say without fail, you know, the, the passion and creativity of the people that I get to work with is kind of what gives me hope for the, the future of, of biodiversity um, and, and being around those people is what kind of inspires me to keep going and what can sometimes be quite depressing. Yeah. Situations. <laughs> Arturo, how about you? Yeah, um, small victories, I think, is what keeps me uh, motivated and hopeful. Um, I am a runner, long distance runner. And when we are running a marathon, we never focus in the, in the, final, in the finish line. We keep focus in the next mile and the one after that. And so that we call them a small victory. So um, that I use the same te technique for work. Um, I just need to uh, keep working. And I know that at the end, something is gonna come in a, from a, from a better place. Right. I love that analogy as a as a as a runner. I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that one from you because uh, that's that's a great way to to think about it and approach it. Louise, how about you? Yeah. So both of those things really resonate with me. Um, I mean, part of it for me is just the resilience of nature and the mysteries. I mean, we know so much and yet we 
we don't know so much, you know, we're still discovering new species and Sonoran sky islands and that kind of thing. Um, and then yes, the young working with young people is so uplifting. We work with students as well. And also I would just say, you know, uh, I think it was Einstein that said, you, you can't solve problems with the same thinking with which they were created. And so, you know, I have a lot of hope um, both working with young people and working in these large collaborations where you're re really bringing together different perspectives and creating new thinking around things that, you know, we'll find different kinds of solutions and new ways to think about the world and do things that will hopefully keep biodiversity thriving long into the future. Great, thank you, Louise. And Lorena? I heard this over the summer that more than hope, it's, it's action. So yeah, there's hope in me, but I also see that people are just working on this. People are just taking action. And, and that gives me, it fills me with optimism whenever I'm feeling down. Um, one thing that I'm very optimistic about, as Louise mentioned, is the collaboration. I see more and more spaces being created um, where people are speaking different languages, they're speaking from their different cultural contexts. So I think that can only bring good things despite the challenges that it might involve. Yeah. Well, I th I'll, I'll answer my end question and say that um, uh, I think what brings me hope is is the, the people who are on the screen and the people who are joining us today. I mean, the you, you guys embody all of the principles that give you hope. <laughs> um, and so so uh, thank you for everything that you are doing to bring hope um, to the natural world and the state of biodiversity, the research, the connections that you're making uh, between different organizations. Uh, it's 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 fantastic and, and it does leave me feeling like those uh, what is it when you the, the hairs rise up on your arm goosebumps that's that's what it is goosebumps. Um, so so thanks for joining us today.